Well, welcome to this presentation, which is basically a short series of videos. And it's for people who want to get into teaching, who want to be professional teachers, or equally importantly, for people that want to do a bit of teaching as they go along, probably at work in a professional context. So it's mostly aimed at adult education. So if you want to improve your ability to teach and communicate when you're at work or more formally, then carry on with this uh, presentation. So this first video clip introduces the series in a little more detail and it asks the really interesting question, are teachers born or are they made? Well, welcome to a new series of videos where we're going to try and teach a little bit about what it is to be a teacher. So these videos are for people that already have a particular subject, someone who has a discipline. So do you have a subject that you're interested in that you want to communicate to others? If so, then this could well be the video and the hopefully series of videos for you. So we're looking for communicators, people who already have skills, people who already have a subject, whether that's a craft subject or an academic subject, who want to communicate that to others. It could be that you want to communicate it to individuals. It could be that you want to communicate it more formally to larger groups, or that you want to communicate with larger communities. But the first thing is, if you're going to communicate your subject, if you're going to teach your subject, you must know your subject well yourself. And you must have an enthusiasm for your subject. Because if you don't have an enthusiasm for your subject, you're not going to communicate that enthusiasm. Enth enthusiasm is something that is infectious. You can infect other people with it. Get them enthusiastic about your subject. And this means that I would suggest you must like your subject and be very interested in it. In fact, I would go further. I would say to be a great communicator of your subject, you've got to love it. Your subject or your profession is not something that you do. It's something that you are. It has to be intrinsic to your nature. That's what gives you the enthusiasm and that's what can make you a great communicator of it. Now, I'm often asked if teachers are born or made. And the answer, of course, is both. But if you're asking me the question, can I teach my subject? The answer is, if you're enthusiastic for your subject, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do this. Now, it's like anything else. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of things you can learn to improve your ability to teach. But there's also, it's also true that some people have a more innate ability. So can you learn to be a competent teacher of your subject? If you're a subject specialist, yes, you can, certainly. If you work hard and you've got an innate ability, you can be a, a good communicator of your subject. And some people can be great communicators. If you've got a genetic ability, if you've got an innate ability in that area, and you work hard at it. So the answer is yes, you can. And there's a lot to learn, actually, that turns you in from, turns you from a subject specialist into a teacher of your subject. There's quite a lot of things to learn. So, for example, you'll learn that your learners need to understand lower order concepts so that you can develop these into higher order concepts, more advanced concepts. And you can learn things that help you to take the student from where they are now to where you would like them to be. So there's plenty of things to learn. But the main thing that will turn you from the subject specialist you are now into a good teacher is your motivation to teach, your motivation to communicate, and hard work. But teaching is very much about practice. So when you learn a skill, you have to practice it. It could be with the person at the bench next to you, on the hospital wall that you're working with, to a more informal group, to a more formal group, but you need to practice communicating your ideas. You need to get feedback from the people that you are teaching. And as you get feedback from them, 
that will give you information about how well you are communicating to these people. It's always an interactive communication process, but you need to practice. And you can practice on anyone you like. You can practice when you're out for a drink, when you're having a meal. You might bore a few friends, you might bore your wife, but that's okay. It'll turn you into a good teacher because you are practicing. So there's many things that we can learn to improve, but basically it's practice. And I think teaching is a fairly practical skill. Now, of course, if you'd like, you can write academic essays on educational theory and on teaching. That's all fine. I'm not criticising that. But what I want to try and communicate is, is largely the way I learned to teach. Now, I'm not saying that's definitely right. It's just what works for me, the way I've learned to communicate things. And I want to communicate things on these videos that I find helpful when I'm communicating and when I'm teaching. So it's very much a how-to sort of series by telling you what works for me, what worked for me when I was learning to teach and, and what has worked for me over the many years that I have been I have been teaching. How we can learn to teach. Now, I teach mostly adults, I teach mostly nurses. That doesn't matter too much because if you can teach, you can actually teach anything. So the skills that we're talking about in this series will be applicable whether you want to teach people to build houses, to lay bricks, to bake cakes, to be chefs, to be surgeons. It doesn't matter too much. The way that we can communicate knowledge and the way that we can build up knowledge and understanding and skills in our learners is common across many disciplines. But I will be looking at this primarily from an adult education point of view, although of course many things that we talk about will be applicable for teaching children as well. But this is primarily for adult education. So for people that want to teach whatever their subject, whether it's informally or whether they want to teach more formally. But the idea is that we are going to teach people to empower them with skills of their own, with knowledge of their own, that the skills that they are performing are informed by knowledge, by good rationales, because we understand the subject and we understand how to communicate it. And this means that we can serve individuals. And this means that individuals can serve the communities in which we live. Because teaching at its best is of the people, by the people, for the people. We communicate, we teach in order to help people and to help communities. So if that's for you, if you have a subject already, you'd like to know how to communicate that more fully in a more able way, then this could well be the series of videos that uh, you, you would find helpful. So if you're asking directions from someone, intrinsic to that question is that you want to be directed to where you want to get to from where you are now. So the most important thing in education is to learn where your learner is at now as you embark on your educational process. Let's look at this in a little more detail. Well, a clever and well-informed person once said this, if I had to reduce all of educational psychology to just one principle, I would say this. And in the next slide, we'll look at what he says. But before we go on to the next slide, I just want to tell you about something that this brings up. In order for something to be learnt, the learner has to pay attention to it. So you could say that which is learnt is that to which attention is paid. So you have to get your learner to focus their attention, to pay attention. And one way to do that is to bring about a certain anticipation that they're looking forward to what you're going to say. So in this slide, I've given you the option here. You can, you can study educational psychology, that huge field. You can study that for years if you want, that's fine. Or, or you could learn just this one principle. So I wonder what this one principle is going to be. Now, if you're interested in this topic, I suspect I now have your attention. So that means when this principle is revealed, you will be paying attention to it. You are alerted to it 
Because remember, if you pay attention to it, you're likely to learn it. So get your learners to pay attention to what you're saying using various methodologies and techniques. And this one of anticipation is one of them. Well, hopefully now everyone is paying full attention to this. And here is the factor. The most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. There's no point trying to teach me about quantum coupling straight off in a, in a lecture because I don't have the background in quantum mechanics. You've got to work out what I know already. So ascertain this and teach him or her accordingly. That's the most important principle. So you've got to learn what your learner already knows. Otherwise you can't teach them effectively. So when we're teaching, we don't want to be going over a load of really simple stuff that they already know because the learners will get bored. We don't want to be pitching the material too high because that will demotivate our students. So facilitates progressive enlargement of the cognitive framework. What does that mean? Well, the cognitive framework is the topic of the next video clip. But just before we play the clip, we want to notice this that to find out what your learner already knows, you have to talk to them and question them in an unintimidatory way. So you have to work on these questioning skills in order for, your, in order for you to make the assessment of what the learner already knows. This is something you have to work at. It's one of the teaching skills that needs to be acquired. So one of the things I found useful when I'm planning lessons and when I'm teaching topics is this idea of cognitive frameworks. And this comes from the pioneering work of David Ausubel, the American uh, psychologist and psychiatrist, published a lot of his work in 1968. And this is the idea that we don't have knowledge in isolation or knowledge is interlinked. So for example, we might be talking to a student who knows something about smoking. Now, when we want to start teaching someone, in this case about the dangers of smoking or anything to do with smoking, we need to find out what they know about it first already. Alcibel stressed this, the most important factor in education is what the learner already knows. So we need to talk to them first and see what they already know. So they might know that there's such a thing as smoking, and they might know that smoking is harmful to health. <clears throat> so this dot here represents knowledge of smoking. This dot here re represents that it's bad for your health. It's a bad thing to do. Smoking's bad. Has health consequences. <clears throat> but can you, can you see that the, health, the bad health consequences are, are related to the smoking? So knowledge that smoking exists knowledge that smoking is harmful for health, two pieces of knowledge, but they're linked. They're linked like that. So the smoking is bad for health. The two concepts are linked. And someone might also know, if we talk to them, that the more they smoke, the worse it is. So that's another piece of knowledge. That dot there represents the individual piece of knowledge that repeated use makes health effects worse. So we see that the smoking and the repeated use are interlinked and that <clears throat> the more someone smokes the worse it is so that's interlinked with that and indeed the whole thing's interlinked in this case because <clears throat> smoking's bad the more we smoke the worse it is and then if we carry on questioning someone they might say well yeah this does lead to specific health problems this leads to particular diseases they might not be sure what diseases it is but they will know it leads to particular diseases. So smoking can lead to particular diseases. And in fact, the more we smoke, the greater the risk of those diseases. So we could maybe get that far. People might know that to begin with. So can you see what they've already got here is a, a cognitive framework. They've already got a structure in their head of individual pieces of knowledge represented by the dots. So they have the individual pieces of knowledge, but these pieces of knowledge are interrelated. 
So Alistair Bell stressed the importance of knowing what the learner already knows. So this is kind of what the learner already knows here. <clears throat> That's their existing cognitive framework about smoking. Now that we know that, we can then start to extend it. So we could tell them that there's such a thing as uh, carcinogens. Carcinogens, chemicals that cause cancer. And when someone smokes, and the more they smoke, the more of these carcinogens they're exposed to. So we've now got a link between increased amounts of smoking and increased exposure to carcinogens. So we give them the information, we tell them about the carcinogens, but then we relate that to things they already know. And this means that their learning experience is becoming meaningful. This is meaningful learning. And, and, and the converse of meaningful learning is rote learning. We could get them to memorize things, but that wouldn't make much sense. They need to interlink the concepts. And then we could go on and say, well, the carcinogens, well, they can cause cancer. So we can say, well, there's such a disease as, there's such a disease as cancer. That's a piece of knowledge. There's such a disease as cancer. And carcinogens exist. But the more we smoke, the more likelihood that the carcinogens will cause this disease called cancer. So that's the disease of cancer there linked to the carcinogens. Can you see these are all linked together? They're not isolated pieces of knowledge. And then we could go on and say, well, look, there's such a thing as cancer of the esophagus. There's such a thing as cancer of the lung. There's such a thing as cancer of the larynx. The mouth and pharynx can become malignant. There can be tumours in the bladder. There can be tumours in the pancreas, kidneys, liver, bowel, cervix, types of leukemia. All of these cancers, we can teach the individual learner that these exist, but that these are related to the carcinogens. So the carcinogens are going to make all these types of cancers more likely. So we haven't just said, right, I want you to memorize a list of cancers. Memorize this list. No, we're not saying that. <clears throat> we're making sense of it in the context of other pieces of knowledge. So each of these dots is an individual piece of knowledge, but they're all interrelated. So we can say, well, look, the more carcinogens you're exposed to, the more the respiratory membranes are going to be exposed to the cancer. Or the more carcinogens you're exposed to, then the more carcinogens will be absorbed in the blood. They will circulate round to organs like the pancreas, the kidney in the liver and potentially cause cancer in those organs. So we can explain the interrelationship between these things. We can say, look, the cancer can affect the bladder. So we know cancer can affect the bladder, but that's because the carcinogens are absorbed into the blood. Some of these carcinogens are filtered out by the kidneys in the urine and the urine is stored in the bladder. So that gives us a link between the cancers and the, or the carcinogens and the cancer. And of course the cancer as well. So we end up with many different interlinking concepts. <clears throat> so each dot is a piece of knowledge. Each line is, is, is information that links these or we could talk about ischemic heart disease, that smoking causes ischemic heart disease. And again, we could say why it affects the, it reduces the levels of the healthy high density lipoproteins and other effects. And then we could go on and talk about smoking cessation and we could build up this cognitive map. So after one teaching session, we might get to there, for example, that might be the next sort of level of knowledge. And then when we come to the next teaching session, we could say, well, what's your role in this? Well, there's such a thing as smoking cessation. There's various drugs that can be used to stop smoking. The psychological 
and the pharmacological can assist each other so they can be interlinked. And of course these are all interlinked with the smoking, with the preventing the cancer, with you get many many cognitive linkages. We want to prevent the heart disease so we get understanding. Each of these red lines represents understanding. So ascertain what the learner already knows, then teach them accordingly, giving them new concepts, interlinking these concepts, relate the old what is already known to the new, interlink the concepts. This is called active assimilation. They can assimilate these new concepts. Concept maps, how items of knowledge are interrelated. One more thing Alcibel did say, he, he said you can give an overall picture, so you can kind of give an overall sketch of something. The idea that smoking is not a good idea. Then put individual pieces of knowledge in here to fill in the details. So we can put individual pieces of knowledge in here and fill them into the sort of the detail of the overall picture and of course these will be interrelated. So we can build up progressively or we can give an overall picture smoking's bad, why is smoking bad? And then build up that idea. And then what do you do about it? So we can give like a, an overarching idea, an overview, and fill in the details later. But either way, it makes sense because we help the learner to make these cognitive links between the information so they understand the information so it's meaningful. Just one example here. Can you memorise those letters for me, please? Right, got that? Right, can you memorise those ones for me, please? Got that? Now, if I asked you to reproduce what was on that piece of paper now, I think you'd be struggling because it has no meaning. It is not meaningful learning. It would be rote learning. Yes, you could memorise those, but, but that, because you already know, <clears throat> what these words mean, you know what this is means, you know what this means, you know what all the words mean, so it makes sense. So it's easy for you to assimilate this piece of knowledge that I went out for a walk with my dog. But that's based on your previous learning, based on your understanding of the words. So we're making linkages based on what you already know. So it's so important to find out what the learner already knows then to make links to individual pieces of knowledge that means that they understand these pieces of knowledge in a meaningful way and how knowledge is interrelated. The challenge is, can you do this? Can you learn what the student already knows? Can you give them new information and make it meaningful to them as an individual? That is the challenge of the teacher. If you want to get somewhere, you need to know where that is, otherwise you could walk off in completely the wrong direction. We need a direction of travel, from where we are now to where we want to get to. And this is where the learning outcomes come in, the outcomes of the learning process. And the best way to learn these is to think about the aims and objectives. And that's the topic of the next clip. Now, having learned something about the nature of knowledge, we're ready to go on and plan a lesson. This is a purposeful activity. We're going to work it out and plan it. And the first question to ask yourself is, do I know this subject? Because if you can't explain something simply, it's because you don't know it well enough. So learn your subject and decide if you are qualified to teach this topic. And then you're going to need a title. What are you going to call this session? So imagine this is going to be advertised on TV or on a newspaper. And the title, are people going to want to come to listen to you speak on that title? So think of a title. So, for example, I might give a lesson called Heart, Structure and Function. Does that sound quite interesting? Would you like to know about the structure of the heart and the function of the heart? So I'm going to call it Heart, Structure and Function for the time being. So having got a title, we then need aims. Now an aim is a broad declaration of intent. It's where we want to get to. And in a lesson, you can have one aim or two aims, normally not more than that, where we want to get to. 
So the aim is to climb Mount Everest, or the aim is to get across the river. It's where we want to get to, the declaration of intent. So my aims for this lesson on heart structure and function are to know the main structures in the heart and how these are anatomically related. That's what I'd like to get to. And I have a second aim as well for this lesson because I'm being a bit ambitious perhaps, but it kind of goes together. And that is to understand the flow of blood through the right and the left side of the heart. Now in an aim, it's also good to give some motivation to the student. Why is this a good idea? So to my second aim, understand the flow of blood through the left and right side of the heart. I'm going to say, and how this promotes fitness. So if people want to understand what it is to be unfit, what it is to be fit, that's fine. This will help them to understand that. It's kind of a motivating clause <clears throat> that I'm putting in there as well to help people understand why it's important to learn this material because we want to promote fitness. Who doesn't want to be fit? Anyone there want to be unfit? No, of course not. So that is the aim, that's where we want to get to. But climbing Mount Everest or crossing the river in one episode can be quite difficult. So for that reason, we're going to need stages of how we're going to get there. And these stages of how we get there, the steps to get from where we are now to where we want to be, to where the aim is, these steps are the objectives. So there's going to be various objectives along the way, the steps to the goal. So the first objective might be to get to Everest Base Camp, then to Camp 1, then to Camp 2, then to Camp 3, then to the summit or however it works. Or if we're crossing the river, the objectives could be stepping stones in the river. So we want to get from this side of the river to this side of the river. Well, let's go to that stepping stone first, then that one, then that one. It's a progressive process to get across the river. So the objectives are steps towards the overall goal. They are stages. And we have to know when the student gets to these stages. So an objective should always begin with these words. The student will be able to, or the learner will be able to. These are what we call behavioural behavioral objectives. We can monitor the behaviour of the learner and make sure they've got there. So the student will be able to. So you need to write the title of your lesson, write one or two aims, and then a few objectives, maybe four or five objectives, There's no fixed number. But you need to write these and they all should begin with the student will be able to. So obviously you don't need to write that every time, you can just write it at the top, the student will be able to. And then it follows that that is the start of every sentence. Now, this is important because it will keep you on track. Now, when you're teaching, Sometimes it's quite reasonable to have a bit of a digression. So a student asks an interesting question and you think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, that, that's vaguely relevant, I'll, I'll do that question now, answer that question now, but then get back onto track. So the objectives keep you on track, they keep you on piste, on the road from where you are now to the achieving the aim, achieving the educational goal. So it helps us keep on track, but it also means that the students know where we're going. So very often, especially when you're starting teaching, you might decide to give out the objectives at the start of the lesson. So the students know what's happening in the lesson. So they can monitor their progress as they go through the lesson. That's fine. The students know where they are. Students can be demoralised if they get a bit confused and don't know where they are. So we have to learn with the students, as it were. We know the material, but we're working with them, we are learning with them. Because the most inexcusable thing in education, and this is what you must never ever do, it is not allowed, you must never demoralise your students. You must only motivate them. The teacher must do no harm. And if you look back in your own educational experience, I'm sure you will see episodes of where education has harmed you. That's really bad education. In fact, that's not education at all. So never demoralise your students, never do them any harm. Never deter from their learning, from their self-worth, from their well-being. So the students know where we're going. We know where we're going. And ideally, when I was learning to write education objectives, my teacher said, imagine that you can't go in one day, you're off sick. 
there's another teacher who has the same knowledge base as you, could he pick up those objectives and walk into a classroom and teach from them? That's the idea. And they should also be progressive. One objective should follow on from another. So let's get back to my heart lesson. I've got label the following components of the heart. Atria, ventricles, atrioventricular valves, mitral valve, bicuspid valve, tricuspid valve, arterial valves, endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. Learn those components, be able to label them. So can you see, if we give the student a diagram and they label them, we can see them labelling them. So label the following components. That's a behavioural objective. We can see that. Another objective could be correctly write and spell the components of the heart that you've learned. Another objective could be define pulmonary and systemic circulation. Can you see these are things we can see the students doing? We can see them writing. We can listen to them define. State the function of the atrioventricular valves and the arterial valves. If the students state that function, we know they've met that objective. And list in order the layers of the heart, the endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. Can you see what I've tried to do there is build up the knowledge progressively. So first of all, you know the bits, then you might try and work out what the components are doing. And then going on to my functional objectives for this lesson, Using blue and red pens, draw the blood flow through the heart. Now, if you're familiar with this, we use red pens for the oxygenated blood and blue pens for the relatively deoxygenated blood. Another objective I've got here is identify changes in heart function during exercise. So again, we can see students identifying the tachycardia, the increased stroke volume or whatever that change is with exercise. And then the last objective for this lesson, because I don't want to do too much at once, is define heart rate, stroke volume and cardiac output. So that they are my objectives for this lesson. And if you were being assessed on this, you could you could actually have a, another teacher sitting at the back and it could be ticking these off potentially. You might get a bit reductionist to do that, but, but it gives you the idea. Now, some people say that ed educational objectives should be smart. S-M-A-R-T. So they should be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time related. So first of all, the outcomes should, the, the objectives, the educational objectives should be specific. We want to know exactly what it is that we need to learn. Do you remember, well, have you ever travelled with children in a car? They're always saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So, so with an educational objective, the student will know when they're there because it's specific. And it should be measurable. As we've said, we use words that we can, we can see. We can see the student carrying out, define, demonstrate, identify, draw, label, create, state, list, name, solve give examples of. Can you see these are all verbs that we can see of the students achieving them. So in educational objectives we don't want words like learn, know, feel, understand. Of course we want the students to understand but we can't see that. Now you can put understand in a name, that's absolutely fine for a name, but not for uh, an objective. We want these to be behavioural. So we don't want words like uh, feel, appreciate, be aware of, that they're things we can't see. So the objectives need to be achievable. No, need to be measurable. Next, they need to be achievable. So it's specific, measurable, next is achievable. Achievable, they need to be based on previous learning and we need to be able to achieve them within the time frame, within the student's ability, within the resources we have. But how far you're going to get is going to depend, as we saw in the last video, very largely on the student's previous learning. So they must be achievable. If we get to the end of the lesson and we say to the students, well, you haven't achieved the objectives for this lesson. Well, again, that's demoralising. As a teacher, you should assess what is achievable and make sure that is achieved within the lesson. They also need to be relevant. 
So if we're talking about hearts, we don't want to start digressing and talking about fingers and toes because that's not particularly relevant to uh, this lesson. And the last, the last part of SMART is time related. So when we're writing these objectives, the student should be able to normally we mean by the end of the lesson. But there's no reason why we shouldn't have objectives for courses as well. So we could say by the end of the week, by the end of the month, by the end of the semester, or by the end of your three year training program. There's no reason why we shouldn't do that. But normally when we're writing objectives, it's the student should be able to do something by the end of a particular teaching session. So that helps smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time related. But the key thing for me when I was learning to do this is that they need to be behavioural. There needs to be something where we can make an adjudication on whether the objective has been attained by the end of the session. So write the title for a session that you'd like to teach, write one or two aims, and then write yourself some educational objectives for what you want to achieve in that teaching session. Now this might seem like a bit of a bit of a palaver, a bit of a fuss, but I found this works. So when I started teaching, I did this for my lessons and I actually found it works. It focuses the mind, it gives you a structure, it gives you some progressive development of the material, and it's a very useful exercise. So teaching is a purposeful, planned activity. And especially when you're starting teaching, you need to develop lesson plans. So here's some of my thinking on lesson plans. Well, we're carrying on the series of videos on teaching skills. And what I've drawn here is a lesson plan. Now this might look very basic, but just bear with me because the aim of this series that is that I want to talk about things that I found useful when I was learning to teach. And a lesson plan is a really good way to focus your thoughts about what you want to teach. Now this is a very simplified version. Yours can be more detailed than this, especially when you're learning. These are really useful. So I'm going to start with background information. Now this background information will include things like the date and time of the session, the duration, the location where the session is going to be, the students that you're going to be teaching, and the number of students, because the number of students in the group is going to affect the strategies you're going to use. We also want to know the students' stage of training, and their background knowledge about the content. And here we can see the content is about the, the heart. We also want to know the name of the tutor or the teacher, that's you. And make a note of what your previous experience with the group is and what their likely previous knowledge is going to be. Because remember, we can only teach people when we know what they already know. We're developing on from their previous knowledge into new knowledge. You can give a rationale for the inclusion of the session and the timing of the session because the session should fit into part of a logical sequence. So, for example, here we're talking about the heart and the nature of the circulation. After this, it might be reasonable to talk about the respiratory system. Before this, we might have done a lesson on the nature of body tissues or the nature of body systems. So it contextualizes and fits into a, a scheme of work. And we want the application to the bigger subject. So this is for um, student nurses. So the application to nursing here could be mentioned. Heart disease is still a leading cause of death. So it's something that we all need to know about. And then think about the equipment that's going to be required. That comes under this column, the aids that are going to be required. Now, the key thing about using equipment in teaching is you've got to make sure it works before you go into the session. The number of times I've gone into class and the video doesn't work or the loudspeaker doesn't work or there's a power cut or, you know, some aspect of equipment doesn't work. 
and you've got to make sure that you're familiar with working the equipment to make sure you can work the video or whatever it happens to be. And also here we can talk about the, uh, the, the venue and how you want to arrange the venue. So do you want the seats in neat rows or do you want them clustered for group discussion? Think about how you're going to lay out your classroom. And here, of course, we can also have the aims and objectives of the session. So this will give us the, <clears throat> the outcomes. If we know the aims and objectives, that, that tells us the outcomes that we want to achieve. And it's these, it's these learning outcomes, the aims and objectives, that are going to inform the content. So we want to have a logical sequence in this lesson plan. So we don't have any major emissions. And we've got a strategy. We've got a way forward that we want to teach it. Now, the lesson plan is related to the subject notes. It's related to the subject matter. But this is as well as the subject matter. So if you're not completely familiar with the content here, then you'll need notes that are going to help you with that process, with that remembering the actual content of the material. If you're more experienced and you've taught it before, then you'll probably know the subject matter already. So we want teaching and learning strategies because we don't want boredom and we do want effective learning. So what we've got here is we've got the times and we've got the content down this column. This is the content here. Now, this is very simplified, as I've said, so you can see it on one side of a piece of paper. The next thing we look at is the teacher activity. And again, that goes down that column there. Then the student activity goes down this column here. These are the aids that are required. And these are how we're going to collect ongoing feedback on the process of the lesson. So this is about management and strategy as opposed to content. And we can also think about learning styles here as well. That kind of comes into this, the teacher activity. What learning style are we going to use? Or what teaching style are we going to use to adapt to the students' differing learning styles? So we need to identify and produce resources as well prior to going into the lesson. So have you produced the resources that you need? Have you identified them? Have you collected them? For example, we haven't got it on this, but we could be using a, a quiz. Or we could be using uh, handouts. We could be using a wide variety of things to, to help us. Now, this last column here, I've got feedback. This is about ongoing assessment. Now, assessment can be formative or summative. A formative assessment is assessment that helps us to gauge how the students are getting on and helps us to adapt what we're doing and teaching to their bespoke requirements. Now, the converse of formative is a summative assessment, and this is how we actually give an exam at the end of the course. So this feedback we're looking at here is formative. It's, it's telling us how the students are getting on so that we can feed that back into what we're doing in the lesson. Because if the feedback here, I've got visual feedback here, if the feedback you're getting there is bemusement and the students don't know what you're talking about, and you've misgaged the stage of this lesson, then there's no point going on with the rest of the lesson because that would be making you teacher-centered. You're going to follow your plan regardless of what happens. Whereas the good teacher is not teacher-centered, the good teacher is student-centered. So if what we're getting here is bemusement, we need to adapt this plan and go back and perhaps teach some low-order concepts that are required first. So really this learning plan that we've got here is tentative, it's provisional. It depends on the ongoing evaluation and feedback that we get from the students as we go along. Now, this shows that we need good preparation for our lessons. So we've got a lesson plan, we've got lesson notes, we've got resources, we've got video clips or whatever it is. So proper presentation or proper, pre proper preparation, <laughs> proper preparation promotes presentable performance. That's one, two, three, four, five Ps. Proper preparation promotes presentable performance. 
The converse of that, of course, is uh, poor preparation promotes probable poor performance. So if you're not well prepared, you're probably going to perform poorly. So that's one, two, three, four, that's six Ps. So remember, poor preparation promotes probable poor performance. Although some people don't say probable poor performance, they use a stronger uh, aspect of phraseology <coughs> in that sentence. So, what do we need? Get it all together, do the preparation. Now this is very simplified here, this is just an illustrative example really, but from 9 to 9.05, introduction to what we're going to teach. We might tell the students about the aims and objectives at that stage and where this fits into the programme that the students are on. And we can just talk to them about that and the students can listen, but we can use a PowerPoint if you want to make some points. And as we've said, we are watching the students to see how they are receiving this material to see if they are assimilating this material into their cognitive frameworks. And then, then this lesson is on heart anatomy, so that is the content. So I need to make sure I've learned that before the lesson or I've got thorough notes on it. And I think what I'll do is I'll draw a diagram. And I'll draw a diagram on the whiteboard, so I'm going to need a whiteboard and different coloured pens. And I'm going to ask the student to produce their own diagram, that's the student activity. And as I do this, I'll be looking at the students to get visual and verbal feedback because I'll be talking to the students and asking questions. Then we want to talk about blood flow to the heart, 9.30 to 9.40. And here we'll develop the diagram. I'll probably draw arrows on it to represent the blood flow. And the students will add to their own diagram. It's a developmental process. And again, we need the whiteboard. And in this situation, the, student, the teacher can walk around the class looking at the students' diagrams to make sure they understand. Don't be stuck at the front of the class with the students stuck behind a great big desk. You can wander around and look at their diagrams and that will give you feedback into how the session is going. More content on uh, heart anatomy and physiology. Again, we've said the teacher here can go around the students to see how they're going on, getting on. Now, what I've noticed here is we started at nine and we've gone to 9.40. So that's 40 minutes. That's a long time to concentrate, actually. That's probably too long, but we won't go any further. So what's a good idea here is to say to the students, well, teach each other what you've learned so far. Recap this material. And gives it, this gives the students time to chat to each other. So... What this means is they've got different activities. So the student starts off listening, then they produce their own diagram, then they add to the diagram, then they're talking to their next door neighbour and talking to a small group. So the student activity is constantly changing. Otherwise, they're going to get bored. If we have teacher talking and student listening all the time, then pretty soon the students are going to completely turn off. And here we've got some verbal learning. We've got some kind of experiential learning in a sense, because the students are working on their own diagrams, adding to their own diagrams. So this is visual here, isn't it? And uh, here we've got social interaction. And then getting towards the end of this session, this is just, just over an hour, this session, it's, a, it's an introduction to the heart. I'm gonna play one of the amazing video clips that you can get now on how the heart actually functions. There's MRIs available, there's open heart surgery videos available. So we can play the video. The students can watch the video. Of course, we have to have the equipment. We have to make sure the equipment works. We have to make sure the sound is working all before we start the lesson. And when we're playing a video, especially if it's sort of this sort of, um, this is an anatomical video. So we want to keep an eye on the students, make sure they're okay. So when the video is playing, the teacher will probably be already familiar with what is on the video. So the teacher can spend their time watching the students rather than watching the video. And that will also give you feedback to make sure that they're concentrating and to make sure that if you see, you can learn to see the degree to which they're understanding the material and make sure they're happy with the material. So as I say, there's a very simplified um, lesson plan here. But when I was learning to teach, I found these immensely useful. 
especially thinking about the timings, the content, what I'm going to be doing, what the students are going to be doing, the age required and the feedback you're going to get. Now, there's no absolute correct way to do this. There's different ways, but this is the way I found worked with these very simple headings. And then you can add detail. Then, of course, when you've done the lesson once, you want to go back and amend this because teaching is very much about ongoing development of your skills. So the idea is that we are bringing the students up to our level of understanding. And I'm just going to close this brief talk on lesson planning with this uh, great diagram from or this great cartoon from David Werner. You might recognise David Werner. He wrote the um, Where There Is No Doctor series of books. Now, this is about healthcare, but it can apply equally to teaching. Here we have the doctor and the patient or the learner in our case is in the pit of ignorance. It's not us casting down medication or casting down knowledge. It's rather us as the teacher helping the student up to our level. There's no hierarchy here. The only difference between me and my students is that I've previously learnt this material. Sometimes that's because I'm older than my students, I'm more experienced, but not necessarily so. But the only difference is that I'm familiar with some material that they want to become familiar with, and we share this together. It is a combination. It is the teacher and the student working in harmony to facilitate a learning process which is beneficial and hopefully enjoyable. If you're enjoying the session, if you're enjoying your teaching, then it's more than likely that the students are also benefiting, enjoying and learning. Sometimes it's good to look at the details and look at the minutiae, but this needs to be in the context of the overall programme, of the overall activity, of the overall teaching that we are engaged in. And this next clip is a review of what can be called the teaching process, an overview. Now carrying on with this series of videos we're doing on teaching, these are the ideas and concepts that helped me when I was learning to teach. So I'm hoping they're going to be helpful for you as well. And one of the things I found useful was looking at a kind of overview of the whole process. So you could call this the teaching process. Now, my own field, as you probably know, is nursing. So we have something called the nursing process and we assess, plan, implement and evaluate. But this is the same for anything. This is a systematic problem solving approach. We assess the needs, we plan what we're going to do about it, we do something and then we evaluate to see if it's effective. Now, in terms of teaching, this means that we can be purposeful. Good teaching should be purposive. This is not opportunistic, this is planned teaching. So it's prepared and we learn the material as teachers. We learn the content and we work out a mode of delivery the process, how we're going to deliver this material. And if we've got a group of students, that's good because in theory, they're all exposed to the same thing. There's parity of exposure. And if this is for one individual assessment or one individual lesson, then that's going to be part of a whole. So we can systematically cover a topic in the context of the whole course. And this can be part of an ongoing curriculum and a spiral curriculum, for example, where we revisit things in more detail. So this is good for teaching. For example, in the example of nursing, it's good for teaching students and uh, peers or the healthcare professionals. But also we need to teach uh, patients. We want to promote their recovery and prevent relapses. And we also want to teach the wider public health promotion and health education. And whatever field you're in, I'm sure you can think of a range of people that you're going to be potentially teaching, including teaching 
people that are professionals, your peers, and including people that are uh, lay people, if you like, people that aren't involved in your particular profession or area of expertise. So assessment. Well, let's take into account the student's previous learning. The previous learning. What the student already knows. The most important thing in education is assessing what the student already knows and teaching them accordingly. So this will help us work out the learner needs, the needs of the learner. Because we have to be student focused, we have to focus on the student. And we also have to think about ourselves, what's the teacher experience? Am I sufficiently experienced? Am I sufficiently knowledgeable to teach this particular topic, whatever the title of this lesson is? But the main thing here in the assessment stage is to focus on the learner. What do the learners already know? How does this fit into what they already know? Because we have to be learner-centred, looking at this from the point of view of the learner, not from the point of view of the teacher. But we have to make sure that we're sufficiently experienced to be able to teach it effectively. Then we need to plan the lesson. So planning, obviously, we can look at aims and objectives. What is it we want to achieve? What are the learning outcomes? What do we need to communicate? And how are we going to communicate it? So there's quite a big how thing here. This is kind of the process we're going to go through as well as the product. And we might take into account things like the environment. What's the classroom like? What's the lab like we're going to be teaching in? How can we optimise that environment? Do we need to go in before the session and set it up in an appropriate way? All these little things actually make a big difference to the way that the session goes and how it's uh, how it's planned and later implemented. But also at this stage, I think it's worth thinking about, again, thinking about the students, thinking about the learner. And one of the things, because we're looking at this from the teacher point of view, is how am I going to form relationships with the students? Because the key thing in teaching very often is how we as the teacher, we as the teacher, how we are relating to the students. Teaching is a very interpersonal activity and how the students are relating to us. So just to give a simple example, when you're learning to teach, it's very easy to be focusing on what you need to teach. And you walk in and if you're well organised, you'll say, right, today we're going to cover the live home where the aims and objectives are this, that and the other. That's wrong. What you need to do is go in to the students and say, well, good morning, everyone. Observe the normal politeness, the, the normal social interactions. This is one human being communicating with other human beings. Sometimes I've gone into a lesson thinking about the content and I start teaching. I think, oh, I forgot to say good morning to everyone. And at that stage, I'll stop and say, oh, by the way, good morning, everyone. Form a relationship. Point out that you're going to be open. This relationship between the students and the teacher is key. And it needs to be planned. Some people are brilliant at it. They can just do it spontaneously. Others of us need to plan as we go along. So we're planning the nature of the relationship. Then we've got the uh, implementation. Well, here we can think about learning styles. Or l learning, yeah, yeah, learning styles is a good way to put it. How are we going to communicate the material? And that'll give us a, a teaching method
So some people um, like to hear things so we can talk to them. Some people like to draw things so we can draw pictures. Verbal and uh, visual ways of communicating. And this can inform our teaching method. So the way the students like to learn should inform our teaching method. So we can give a lecture or we can have small group discussions or role play or project work or talk and chalk or talk and whiteboard as it might be in more modern situations. Or we can have learning contracts or experiential learning or buzz groups or directed study or discussion or debate or brainstorming or simulation or question and answer. So think about the particular teaching methods that you might be employing that interact well with the learner's preferred style of, of learning. Always remember another golden rule here is, is talk with people. not at them. So this is not, uh, it should not be a didactic discourse. Sit down, I'm going to dictate and you take notes. It shouldn't be like that. It should be a discussion, talking with people, not at them. Now this is easy, of course, if you have a small group, but if you have a larger group, it becomes more difficult. And that is more challenging, but you do need to interact with the group in some way. So you might nominate individuals, you might ask people to volunteer, you might um, ask people to put their hand up, or you might systematically go through the whole group as the lesson progresses. As long as you don't intimidate the students, that's fine. But you need to work out some way that you're going to interact with them. So you're talking with them, talk with them. And this means that you are going to modify and adapt what you say as you go along, depending on this ongoing feedback that you get from the students. And at this stage, the implementation, we're thinking about two things. We're talking about product. And we're also talking about process. The process we go through. So the product is the end thing, that, that is the learning, that is the ability to manipulate data. It's what we are getting out of the lesson. It's kind of the takeaway product, if you like. But the process is also important because students can learn through the process. This is the process that we go through as we implement different learning methods to facilitate different learning styles. And then the last part of the process, as we see here, is the evaluation. So has learning occurred is the very simple question. Has it worked? Has learning occurred? If it hasn't, then you could argue that the whole thing's been a, a bit of a waste of time. Learning needs to occur. And this can be evaluated in a formative way. So formative learning is, or form, formative evaluation or assessment is ongoing. It is not marked, but then later on it can be summative. Summative means there's a formalized examination or formalized process of assessment. But formative evaluation should be going on all the time. So has learning occurred? And of course, this evaluation stage has to lead back to the assessment stage for next time. So having gone through this process, how are we going to improve it for next time? Because even after I've been teaching for a very long time, you still modify lessons depending on the experience you've had in one particular session. So this is very much you moving on from being the subject specialist to being the communicator of the subject. Learning to think as a teacher, learning to work as a teacher, 
And if this helps you, fine. If not, don't worry about it. But I found it useful to think about the stages, assessment, planning, implementation and evaluation.